Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Scholar AI Founders Pod. Be sure to check us out on all of the podcast platforms and find us at our YouTube channel at Scholar AI. So, everybody, we've had lots of movement in the AI space. Things are moving fast, as always. I want to start today's discussion by setting the stage for Google Search and specifically um, following their recent announcement. They've integrated AI into their search product and now have recently clawed that back a little bit um, after some kind of, you know, let's call them not great results. So, uh, Shashi, I want to start with you. What do, what do you think about Google's positioning in this age of AI? What do you think about their recent kind of successes and or failures in integrating AI into their search? Why is that maybe a hard problem? And then we'll go to Lakshay um, for, for some kind of more technical discussion on what might be happening under the hood there. So, Shashi, I'll, I'll tee it up for you first. It's a really difficult position for Google to be in. It's a classic innovator's dilemma. They have a lot of customers users who are very accustomed to their existing UI and the flow of that UI. It also generates a huge amount of profit for them via via their ad revenue. And making a fundamental change to that is, is business altering for them in almost every situation a bad way. Uh, so it's it's very difficult if you are in the position of Google to alter your, your core product to be more like Something new, uh, let's call that uh, perplexity for the point of conversation, though they're not the only one kind of playing in this game. There are lots of um, fresh approaches to UI, but Google is in a position, in a very difficult position in which almost every scenario in which they change their core application is bad for them financially. So what do you do if you're Google? Google's been the the underlying innovator in so much of this AI um, trajectory that we've been on and yet hasn't been in the pole position in terms of capitalizing on that, whether that's on usage or any other metric, um, and certainly not in revenue. Um, Gemini is dwarfed by OpenAI and every every kind of expected um, financial metric, even though those numbers aren't public, obviously, for OpenAI or for anyone else for the most part. Uh, But uh, Google's not winning that race. So what what are you to do if you're Google? Um, the, the, The smart play is probably to continue your current trajectory with your current app as is, understanding that there are uh, incursions into your market share. And what do you do about those incursions? You either internally develop alternate UIs for V2 or some other domain name that is underlying, um, that that has the Google technology underneath it, but has a a very different UI experience for uh, customers who are looking for that, but also looking for the trust. Fundamentally, I think that's what Google can can parlay is their uh, their trust, their um, frictionless experience with a Google account. There's a lot that, that can be leveraged with new UI approaches. So that's that's what you I, I would suggest if I were Google. I wouldn't try to reverse integrate um, a lot of the AI technology into their legacy application. I would just continue their legacy application for the large cohort of users who only want that and don't want a bunch of new stuff in their in their default Google search experience. Yeah, just one one comment with specific regard to that is they are um, in some of the sandbox environments I've seen, the kind of Google Labs releases, they do have kind of a web button, which essentially takes you back into the you know UI that we're familiar with from, you know, let's call it five years ago or something like that, basically gets rid of all AI features like you're describing. So I, I do wonder if that's on their roadmap and then um, how they're kind of going to integrate it. One one comment to the larger point, which is I do think sometimes people look at these major incumbents that have market dominance and they fail to see that innovators dilemma as a startup's opportunity, right? And speaking about perplexity, um, you know, uh, solely right now, although you said correctly that they're not the only ones in the space, they do have an opportunity to dominate AI search, assuming that does become fundamentally a different category than just search. Where that puts Google, I don't really know, but you're right in that Google is inherently incentivized to not disrupt their current customer experience, which people really like. And therefore, there it leaves some semblance of an opportunity for a new startup perplexity or otherwise to kind of enter a new regime when we do see fundamental kind of technology or platform shifts. I'm like that. So let's let's close that for a moment. But then actually, I want to kind of throw this to you. And I, and I want to do so with uh, kind of a, a increased focus on technology 
platform of Google search. So independent of whether Google should be integrating AI into their search product or not, we have seen them in limited runs integrate AI into their products and and do so mostly unsuccessfully, meaning it's it's been either bad, meaning it's been factually inaccurate. It has been kind of on in this weird gray area of not necessarily factually interact, in, inaccurate, but having some sort of weird internal kind of biases or, um, you know, predisposition to kind of lead to one result set or the other. And so I just want to tee up the question for you to speak about this, because we, we deal with this a lot at Scholar AI, specifically in that, in that all RAG, which is essentially what AI plus search has kind of become, at, at least to, to the generalized use case, why RAG is such a hard problem and then why RAG, why all RAG isn't created equal. So I want to, I want to pause there and get, kind of give you the stage for a moment to just kind of speak openly about that. Yeah, I think with the one thing that's, I think, been weary over the last year is that Google's been forced to rush, whereas normally like they spend years building something that never sees public eye. I think when you look at what an AI generated or like an AI assisted search functionality is inherently, it comes with randomness, right? Everything you're generating has a degree of randomness built into it. That's just how these models work. That's true. I think the the difficulty for someone like Google, whereas even for us, like we're relatively niche, but the moment we push out like an update for like our rag system or something like that, there's just a number of cases you can't necessarily be ready for. You can't predict one, the AI generation entirely. Two, you can't predict the human interaction entirely, right? I think when you look at like what Google gets on a day-to-day basis, the sort of queries that they want to be ready for and just say like, oh, like, hey, yeah, like throw an AI response on this thing could be so absurd to the level of just like, oh, not how, what are the ingredients of like baked bread, right? But it could be something as far as like, I have this like three-part query with like many different pieces to it. I need them to be decomposed and understood by the machine and then generated from, right? Inherently, like the difficulty of rag is not just a machine problem it's a human problem right you need to be ready and you can't exactly prime your users to behave in the way you want to if you're going to assume that they get a text box right i think when you look at most lm systems you could probably find that hole and poke it basically um it's just the problem is Google is just so big and they already have such a large user distribution that that problem is like heavily inflated for them, right? There's less room to get it wrong. There's less room to like adjust and course correct because Google gets so many like inbounds per day. Even just to have a system that tells them when they're like LM rag systems are doing wrong is a very difficult ask, right? Um, it's a number of unsolved problems that just go into these rag systems we understand human logic, we understand human reasoning and how to talk about LMs and how to talk about and synthesize ideas. But to have a machine that we can say with 100% correctness, hey, it did a good job, is one that's still even relatively unsolved. I think, I think that's well said. And summarizing it just from my kind of point of view from a from a almost a third party kind of a user of these systems, but not someone who has hands on building these systems all the time, like the the contextual awareness of the results in this stochastic system, as you outlined, is a challenging problem and kind of by definition, given the stochastic nature, a a problem with a constantly moving goalpost, right? These things are always changing. The information that can go into these systems are always changing. The the intelligence, quote unquote, of these systems is always changing. And so we just have all of these shifting variables inside of this, you know, relatively infinite problem space. And I just think it's a fascinating goal. Whereas in some ways, this was always the challenge for Google, but they they built a deterministic system. So it was it was just less moving parts. Now they're trying to index the world's information, quote unquote, but using a stochastic, you know, engine, if you will, is, is a different problem space than using the deterministic stuff they were using before. So I, I yeah, I appreciate you putting that into perspective. And I think that when people hear rag, they just assume that all rag is created equal and that just it's very much is not the case at all. And I also wondered Extending that thought um, beyond RAG, I do wonder what at the system prompting level Google is doing to maybe help improve this problem, right? Like have these stochastic systems approaching more of a deterministic system or at least injecting more kind of quote unquote thought into how these uh, language models are interacting with the information that they uh, might be passed. So, um, yeah, any, any closing thoughts on Google? Yeah. Yeah, with fundamentally like 
rag, I think is a term to like capture an idea in the LMs, but fundamentally it's just like very, very simply, it's like retrieve from my database, search my search index, right? Those are the two real things that happen with rag in like any sort of context. I think what, what the problem ends up really being for someone like Google is that they're retrieve from database function is probably really good, right? That, that's what their bread and butter is. That's why they have the position they do. The problem is that like to get a system to, as you said, contextualize and be able to understand the nuances of what the user is asking for and understand the nuances of the document that has been retrieved is just inherently a lot heavier. I think we're seeing a lot of interest in like kind of the web browsing agent space. Zapier wants a piece of it. Of course, Google wants a piece of it, perplexity, whosoever, for good reason. In just that, like, as you said, with a very infinite problem space, um, there's a lot of opportunities to get things right and get certain things wrong. But maybe if you pick the right user, you can ignore some things. Maybe in some cases you can um, make assumptions that get you to mostly write for who your audience is. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. And I think that's well said. Shashi, any closing thoughts on Google? No, I'm interested in the perplexity angle if you want to move in that. Yeah. Direction. Yeah. So that's where I was going next. I mean, I think, I think that given, given the stage that we've just set with Google, um, how, how then do you, Shashi, as, a, as an onlooker, as somebody who is building in the AI space and then as somebody who is, um, seeing you know, a variety of these kind of incumbent technologies be maybe supplanted by new startups? Uh, how do you see perplexity playing in this kind of generation of AI search? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been asked by some trusted friends, what, what do I think of perplexity, particularly as an investment? And I thought I'd, uh, expand on that here. So what, what is perplexity? Fundamentally, it is a user interface difference innovation, and it is retrieval augmented uh, generation of common crawl, essentially common, com public web content. So, um, what, what your, betting on for perplexity is that their user interface has given them enough of a following and user base that they will continue to generate revenue from subscription and future in the future generate ad revenue any consumer oriented business uh, google certainly fits but so does you know perplexity any consumer search based business will need to have ad revenue. There's just not a scenario there in, in, in my mind where they can generate enough without ad revenue purely from subscription. There's going to need to be a free tier with a substantial amount of advertising to, to generate the kinds of numbers that they will need to ultimately justify whatever valuation they think they're worth today. So um, so they, they have a lot of building to do. Perplexity has a lot of building to do, particularly in the, in the ad revenue generation systems that will need to be put in place in order for them to, to monetize in that way. The question then is how defensible is their RAG and how defensible is their UI? Um, the, the UI does not feel defensible because it's fairly easy to deliver. If not a copy, then something very similar. And um, so that does not feel defensible. Uh, rag of public data is also in my mind, not particularly defensible. You can get common crawl data quite easily and you can, if you have the money, set up systems to do rag on, on that large data set. So neither of those piece, those pillars feel particularly defensible. Uh, but what they have is users and, and that, that, that's the question is how far can they take that, that following with users? At least that's, that's how I think of it, but I'd, I'd love to hear how, how you both think of that. Actually, so you want to take that first? Yeah, I think in general, as it stands, I'm pretty short on perplexity. I think like if we were to assume that their niche stays the one that they currently have of AI search like assistant, yes, they have users, but I also feel that like the amount of market share they have currently is just kind of dwarfed in general, relative to ChatGPT, relative to Google, it is significant for a startup, but it's not significant like the grand scale of like where users are gonna go when they want this sort of product. Um, two, I think that I agree with Shashin that I don't think rag over public data and a interface is enough of a defensible thing to justify like that company existing on its own. I think 
if I were to change my opinion on perplexity, it would be because they start doing something different, right? They aren't competing in the AI search space as a consumer tool. I don't know exactly what that ends up looking like, but otherwise, like, I just don't see how perplexity survives in the long run, right? Especially as we see like OpenAI trying to be more of a consumer tool, like they're providing applications at the hardware level, they're providing applications that work all over the place and they're probably going to be like starting to eat up a lot of the market share that Perplexity was hoping to grab. I don't have a ton to add to either one of those points. And in large part, I agree with most of that. So instead, I'm going to kind of play devil's advocate just just for the sake of kind of uh, the discussion, not necessarily because I, be- I believe wholeheartedly that that um, Perplexity will execute on this vision. But what what we have seen internally and externally is that AI search comes with this two-sided problem that essentially pits quality against speed. And so perhaps perplexity can begin to innovate if they can adequately balance those two for the general user use case, meaning maybe they're giving 95% of the quality of results, but they're doing so in a fraction of the second where getting to that 99.9% quality result would take, you know, many seconds or maybe even minutes. Maybe that's where they can generate a technological advantage that makes them the go-to place for open web AI generated search. I think that if I were going to kind of you know define a defensible position for them, that seems to be one. Right. Because as as we've seen this intelligence grow, as we've seen this this intelligence layer become increasingly commoditized, what is true is that all models from the major players get better over time. Most of the time the kind of flagship model or the most powerful model from each of these players is slow relative to prior generation models, slow and expensive, I I should add. And so maybe there's room for perplexity to build add-ons, whether that be some sort of advanced RAG system, whether that be something that kind of is yet to emerge, you know, LoRa type uh, techniques, those, those kinds of things in which they can actually get to the performance of emerging models in a cost and latency structure that is much, much better for the use case of generalized web search. So again, that doesn't necessarily feel like the strongest of arguments to me, but if I were going to make a case for why perplexity or somebody in perplexity shoes could technologically differentiate themselves, it does feel to me like there is some innovation gains that can be had there. So um, Joshi or uh, Lakshay, any reaction to that? I don't disagree with what you're saying, Damon. I just want to add another. This is this is totally on feel. I feel like the founder Arvind is. I just get SDF vibes from him. I just get like, I don't know, ego, maybe kind of overinflating what they've done or what they can do. Rag isn't that that hard fundamentally, <laughs> and, and and their UI is 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 good, but it, what they have done is not particularly impressive from any kind of moat perspective. And the way that I see him portraying himself feels very SBF or or even um, uh, Theranos. Um, I forget the the woman's name, Elizabeth Holmes from Theranos. Uh, I kind of get those vibes from him, and so I, like Lakshay on. I'm short on perplexity. I wouldn't go anywhere near a multi-billion dollar valuation. I do think there's a decent chance if you got in earlier that an exit to Google for $2 billion isn't out of the question. Uh, but I think investing now probably feels like a, like a bad idea and you're likely to to not get your money back out. Um, that, that's my, my gut feel. Yeah, it was um, regarding the, the founder vibes. It was... Um... They did some big marketing push like a couple months ago. I, I would assume like this was like late 2023 and like they're on like all the like founder channels and whatever, like doing like a big marketing push. It was really funny. Like time about like we're here to like disrupt Google ads shouldn't be anywhere near search. We're here to purify the Internet. And like all he did was just like LMs plus a Google SERP API, <laughs> which I just I don't know. I found it really, really funny when you just like you just like pause for a moment, like you're, you're still using Google. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> um, but it, it was. Yeah, I, I very much agree. It's very much just like founder visionary, like probably wants a statue of him on campus sort of <laughs> angle, you know? <laughs>
Yeah, you get vibes of like a guy who struggled to get dates for a long time and is now like, suddenly <laughs> damn. <popular> but- <laughs> and, and, <laughs> no, you do right. Like, that's like that's yeah. the vibe you get from this guy. Is like, oh, he he's, like doesn't know how to handle this kind of this thing, and maybe on mm. a little bit of an ego trip. Like, uh, mm. uh, the vibe I get. But um, but fundamentally, I guess going back to your your broader question, Damon, and uh, I, I would say there there's a na- narrow chance of a company like Perplexity. Um, fundamentally disrupting Google. I also want to draw a distinction between something Lakshmi like said earlier, um, segment as a market segment. So there's consumer, and that's where Google Search lives. That's where Perplexity is trying to carve out some space and there. And and there's there's a whole market there, and that market, consumer oriented market, requires innovation, requires an amount of ad revenue to subsist because most consumers are not going to pay you a subscription. So this is this is sort of like um, the LinkedIn model, the Facebook model. All of these need some amount of of, of ad based revenue uh, to to subsist. There's then there's then the uh, professional use cases. And Lakshay earlier described a, a multi level search with kind of com- complex components within each of those levels. And that sounds like a professional use case question. Google isn't fundamentally in that space, and that's really where more complex applications are built, often bespoke on top of applications um, like an Oracle or, or other professional kind of building blocks that professional teams build on top of. That's why companies hire engineers often. And there are some, some applications that are that are really good out of the box. Slack is a good example. Um, good out of the box um, serves a use case uh, professionally. Um, how do you see that distinction? And do, do you think anyone is getting real traction on the professional side? I'll go first because I can be relatively fast, I think. Um, it's definitely Anthropic's focus. Um, they're leaning very heavy into the enterprise use case. That's why I don't think that we're seeing much emphasis in whatever their would-be chat GPT competitor is. So I think that's an interesting one to watch. I don't have specific you know, evidence or data of how much traction they're actually going, but in all of their publicly facing statements, they are, you know, for all intents and purposes, enterprise focused. Um, and I do think that we have seen OpenAI gain some significant traction and people wanting to build on top of their um, platform. So I just saw recent announcements. There was obviously the Moderna um, kind of information that was they had used, you know, tens of GPTs across some different systematic processes in, in inside of their organization. And then recently, I also saw that PwC uh, entered into an agreement with OpenAI to, I believe, build um, using seats in the hundreds of thousands range. So maybe, maybe even a hundred thousand, um, you know, enterprise seats uh, or licenses, if, if you want to call them that. So, you know, I, assuming that is true, um, I would dim- I would definitely qualify that as um as as some traction. So those are kind of the instances that I've that I've seen. Yeah, I'm generally looking at so I think like just observations and again this is like Twitter sphere like there is a visibility bias into this, but I think generally the way I felt about consumer is that a lot of the places we're seeing success ends up being like theme park attraction sort of revenue right you end up getting a lot of consumers who like see a new ai thing want to give it a try and use it for a while but ultimately like one incumbents right now are pretty fast insofar as that like if you are making something that is at least like decently obvious and decently applicable as a idea your indie hacker project would probably get like relatively high upside for the time being relative to what like a crypto indie hacker project would or what mobile app would, right? You'll have more success in the shorter term. But I think when you try and look at trying to make a consumer like disruptive business, you're just kind of going up against giants in a way that's a little bit unrealistic. And I think especially now, like seeing OpenAI act as a very consumer oriented company, I think you're just kind of playing a losing game where if you want to serve general purpose LM tooling, you're going up against very big people who already have very big momentum on converting their enterprise relationships in from consumer into proper contracts. And on the other side, um, consumers don't see too much. If you are to start doing something really disruptive, grabbing audience is a really, really hard thing to do anyway, right? I think in general, like I look at consumer as a difficult game if you want to make a general LLM app, again, 
if you're like a sole indie hacker, you'll probably have, you can probably make a good amount of money if you just like make an app and make it available and serve a particular niche right now. But I don't think it has legs in the longer term. What I think does have legs in the longer term is you find a specific user, they're expensive as a person, you find their specific problem and you don't build a general purpose application for them. What you build for them is something that's very, very niche and very, very specific to the way they work. And in that way, you're isolating um, even your own problem space, right? You're not left to the vulnerabilities that Google is seeing that their RAG system has because they have to handle the whole internet. They have to handle Reddit. Instead, I mean, we even see that with like some uh, startups, like the one that's coming to mind are like CRM ones where instead of crawling the entire internet, you focus on crawling LinkedIn, right? To get news about a company, to understand like what they have ongoing, right? You close up your problem space and you're allowed to be specific enough that your accuracy can be a lot higher. So even if you are doing something like RAG, you're doing something like a chatbot, you're doing it for someone whose problem space is so specific that you can do it quite well to a way that stands out relative to general purpose ChatGPT or so on. Yeah, I think largely that is correct um, and said a slightly different way. I, there's there's some layer of intelligence that has become commoditized, right? These foundation models can all kind of do the same thing. And so there's some debate that will be ongoing, probably in perpetuity, around how much of the tech stack and as a translation, how much of the intelligence layer is kind of commoditized by these foundational models. What Lakshay is essentially saying is there's always going to exist some specialization layers on top of those things. How granular the use case likely increases the demand for specialized tooling. And so I think the question becomes, how well can you build a system that is specialized yet generalizable such that you can build a sustainable business on it? And then secondarily to that, in route to sustainability, how do you also build systems vertically integrated that scale with improving model performance? Because we have to assume foundational models will improve. We can debate the rate, we can debate the the timeline, but we I, I think it would be foolish to assume that we have reached complete saturation in foundational model uh, performance. So just kind of wanted to reiterate that it, it, it's exactly in line with the ways that I think we have thought about it internally and the way that we discussed it. But I do. It seems to me like that is becoming a, a more and more obvious uh, kind of phenomenon we're seeing play out across this industry. Yeah, I think like in general, the way I'm looking at if I'm mean, beyond like the macro economy of like difficulty to raise at seed or whatever for a startup or a new person starting a business. I think like in general, an attitude of anyone who's building right now should be like prepared to have your plans like thrown entirely 90 degrees the wrong way. I think there are enough innovations happening from the big players that even like what might be a standard approach or like a very standard set of vernacular about like, oh, like you rag this thing, you chunk your document, then you break it into pieces and you semantically search them, right? Even that is probably going to be old news in like two or three years. We've seen, for example, like multimodal models, if you want to web browse, are really, really good. It's just right now they're too slow. The speed problem isn't gonna, probably is not going to last that long given the current trajectory, right? Um, so it very much feels that like what the attitude of a builder should be right now is try things, be on the leading edge as long as possible um, and focus on specific use cases because that way your current audience has reasons to continue using your solution over a general purpose one, right? Otherwise you just risk kind of getting crushed under the wave basically. Yeah, I think you building on that, the way that to actually build a sustainable business, this applies to emerging markets probably more so than other markets, is you, you, you have to continue to innovate, right? And that speed of innovation, it, it just kind of has to remain high. That's difficult to do as a startup because you have limited resources, you have limited people, you have limited capital, but it, but it is kind of the name of the game. And it, 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 that's especially true in a technology sector like AI, in which the technology is rapidly advancing, right? The the kind of leading edge, as you're describing it, Lakshay, moves on a kind of weekly, monthly, definitely yearly uh, basis. So it is, um, it's, it's a fascinating time. I, I kind of want to use that as a segue, actually, to, to tee up the next question, which is, what do we think about AI valuations 
given everything that we just said, um, g- going back to the perplexity of it all, raising a new round, going back to the recent uh, news reports of Elon Musk's newest company called XAI raising at an increased valuation, um, you know, speculatively becoming one of the top two or five most valuable AI companies in the world. So, Josh, I want to I kick this over to you. What, what do we think kind of largely about the AI industry? Is it is it reaching peak? Do we think it's still on its way up? I mean, obviously, we're kind of future predicting here, which is inevitably a dangerous game. But I'm just curious as to how you're kind of um, reflecting on that. We had this massive increase in the number of startups in AI. Uh, that that uh, Cambrian explosion o- over the last two years since the beginning of uh, of ChatGPT has created um, a lot of activity and a lot of small startups getting started, getting funding, in some cases, taking a shot at a slice of this uh, overall uh, new stage of growth. And uh, it's, it's not dissimilar to what we saw with mobile. It's not dissimilar to what we saw with the beginning of the internet. So we saw these kind of th- these platform changes with lots of startups. Many of them die. That's sort of the, the natural evolution is that there and en- there ends up being uh, king of the hill in every kind of different size hill in every different niche and specialty in the consumer space. It's hard to imagine OpenAI and Google not being the two likely winners of that. However, it plays out, uh, it, it, the odds are predominantly in the favor of those two organizations figuring it out and winning in the consumer space. At least that's my calculus of it. In the professional space, I think, as Lakshi said, every specialty will have its own smaller kings of the hill uh, in, in every kind of pocket of, of expertise and specialized work. And, uh, and that's where Scholar AI plays. That's where a lot of other, I think, smart companies are playing is how can we uh, overfit, over-specialize, super optimize for one group of people who are trying to create value? And how do we smartly combine both human intelligence and machine intelligence into a single workflow so that the net effect is, is much greater efficiency, speed, quality uh, than what a purely human-based workflow could execute on before? I think that's the smart play. Um, but um, in terms of investment, I think the the volume of investment, the number of companies being invested in, will go down. Uh, I think the amount, the dollar amounts, will continue to go up as companies get traction. So the the fewer companies that do end up surviving and continuing forward and building, I think they will raise more net dollars as a result of being able to demonstrate traction and thus justifying continued investment in growth uh, and taking market share from incumbents who maybe weren't as fast, uh, weren't as technically able to generate technical velocity and growth, and therefore um, incumbents who aren't able to insert this technology will lose out market share as a, as a net effect of this whole change. Actually, any thoughts down there? Not going to lie, I forgot what the original prompt was. <laughs> <laughs> Just, just a kind of overall state of the AI AI market. Are we are we inflated? Right, How do we right. see this kind of thing Thank playing you. out over time? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I was just testing your memory. Don't worry. That was <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, I think in general, when you look at a VC's perspective, it's it's reasonable levels of betting, right? Like I think there are cases where we'll see. I think like XAI will might succeed as like, for example, an inference business in the long term, right? They might succeed as a provider rather than like a consumer tool. And I think when, if I were in the shoes of a VC looking at these like series A, B, C companies that are like, okay, we're seeing ChatGPT and Google dominate consumer. You guys are currently consumer, but I've seen that you guys are fast and can move pretty quickly. I would assume at a certain point it becomes like VCs, if they're smart, end up steering the strategic ship just a little bit more, seeing like what the event horizon is for consumer. And then moving, giving that capital, understanding that the team has been succeeding in their current domain. I would assume that for those companies, the long term is no longer the domain of consumer, right? When I look at XAI, like obviously like Elon company that comes with its own valuation, I'm sure. But even within that, 
XAI, like you will find it like remarkably fast. People find it like pretty solid. And for like what I assume is a pretty scrappy team, it's a very, very incredible piece of technology, right? It's very, very functional for a very, very short lifespan. Um, and that counts for a lot insofar as talking to someone who's trying to give you money and saying, why should I, right? I don't think in the long term, I would bet that these companies are still pitching consumer and they're still trying to fight for market share just because that is such a tempting idea. Like the idea of like actually taking a significant chunk of Google is a very, very enticing one. I just don't think it's a realistic one. And so maybe in the pitches, that's what comes across. But if I were a VC, that wouldn't be why I'd be putting money into these companies, right? I'd be doing it because the team's very good. They have execution ability. And we've seen that given circumstances, they are functional and being disruptive, right? Um, how that plays out in the long term has to come with changes, but it's the correct group of people to pull that off. Yeah, I think the only food for thought I would add, I think, is number one, there's, as I see it, there are kind of two conflicting factors in regard to this explosion of AI companies. Number one, the overall kind of amount of quote unquote risk capital in the system right now is relatively low. So there's room to grow on just that side, uh, just kind of purely there, there, you know, we, we can wake up in a, in a macroeconomic climate, you know, in 12 months that is fundamentally different from the one that we're living in now. And if you believe that's going to happen, you can make the case for more investment being in at large, therefore more of that trickling into the AI industry. On the other side of that, you know, if, if we want to call that a suppression effect, there's a, there's a kind of a, you know, a, a fueling effect that is we've seen a fair number of companies who were previously not AI companies and who may have been funded for something else, you know, most famously um, Rabbit, perhaps kind of started out in the crypto space and they've transitioned into the AI space because they're kind of seeing this explosion of AI companies. They're seeing fueled growth there. They're seeing opportunity in, in the consumer space, as Lakshay was saying, maybe longer tail opportunity in the um, enterprise or business to business space. So it's it's interesting to me that as as this hype wave cycles, whether we believe in its, you know, kind of truth or whether we think we're headed towards kind of a, a, a subtle or even a major downturn, we might start to see fewer and fewer companies pivoting into the space. Um, so that may kind of reduce the number of AI companies that are available. Well, also, we might see more investment dollars uh, from a pure volume standpoint flowing into the overall market. So how that affects the AI space um, is, is yet to be determined. But I do find it fascinating that, um, you know, we are seeing lots of companies who essentially begin with a thesis of we are going to use AI. We have no idea what problem we're going to address yet. We're going to try three to five to 10 and hope one of them sticks. Consumer is the easiest way to get some traction. Therefore, we'll go there first. And, um, you know, we, we've seen that uh, play out kind of time and time. So um, I'll pause there uh, momentarily for uh, any reaction to that. And then uh, we'll kind of close this thing out. So, Shashi, you're, you're smiling. Any, anything you got? I'm laughing about uh, the rabbit founder. Uh, his name is Jesse. Have you, have you seen his, like, his socks? <laughs> like the confidence in which he projects what this little device can do is like, it, it's like, in a way, like it's really inspiring. And then you see the reviews and you're like, wow, like this guy really pitched this little box to do all this stuff. It's like, it, it's almost like farcical, but you, know, you got to give him credit for like, he's got the presence to pitch this little thing to do a whole bunch of stuff that it does not at all do. Uh, yeah. So anyway, I was, I was down in the laugh about that. He's he's a very well experienced crypto founder. What can you do? <laughs> if crypto will teach you anything. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I, I'm gonna open so. up a new thread. So okay. no need to delve into this if there's a uh, no desire to given the timing. But I do wonder, given like the lower amount of capital, just like especially available for seed stage companies, um, and even pre seed for that matter, I do wonder like conventionally like silicon valley sf like all those places were based around like grow fast at any cost operate at unprofitability for like as long as possible as long as you're growing that's the primary metric on which you're succeeding right i do wonder how much that dialogue is the same i guess especially this year given like 
how much interest there is in AI startups as at the builder level and how many of them are popping up versus how many of them are able to get money. Like it feels like it's a weird, very complicated inversion um, compared to what would usually be the case. I just wonder whether generally startups are still looking at it as get capital, burn at any cost, how that dialogue's changing, if it's more steady and how people who are very, very early are looking at money and burn rate effectively. Mm. I think what's different from the previous wave that you're describing of grow fast at any cost is that now there's a cohort of this indie hacker kind of mentality that can be small, cheap, get enough revenue to subsist to never need to raise any money. And, um, and th- that cohort of you know, solopreneurs is, is much more significant, at least in my perception. I don't have data to back this up, but my perception is that that cohort is much bigger now than it was previously in the, in the ZERP era when, when we had zero interest rates. And there was so much money in VC that VC could fuel lots of these shots on goal. Those people would probably take venture funding and build. And if it worked, great. If it didn't work, no problem. We go do it again. That's sort of the, the mentality that uh, entrepreneurs had during the Zerp era on venture funding. And now with venture funding where, where it is today, where there's a lot more startups, there's a lot more VC funds. Uh, but it's just very competitive now. All of it feels really, really hard and really competitive. In this era, um, I, I would I would guess that the 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 solopreneur is a much bigger cohort, and the I think there's going to be an AI winter coming. Uh, there's we've talked about this before. There's an AI winter of of running out of money, running out of credit cards to to kind of stretch this thing out and. AI lets you build cheaper for longer. So I think that that process is going to take a little bit longer, uh, but um, there will be that that moment where a lot of AI startups that were super interesting, sexy, maybe raised money, maybe tried to raise money and didn't. I got some revenue, but it dried up or their churn kind of ate away every, every revenue channel they had. Um, and there's going to be a lot of uh, erosion of those startups. That's my guess. I think there's a few things. Um, well, there's more than a few, obviously, but a, a few like very high level things that, you know, I, I would use to frame this conversation is VCs fundamentally are in the business of deploying capital and then also getting that capital back in the form of returns. Right. And so when we're, when we think about how VCs can invest in the earliest stage of startups, a lot of that is actually shaped by what is happening at the end of the startup life cycle. Specifically, that means the IPO market and the M&A market, right? And we've seen suppression of those overall markets. So again, I, I'm just setting that as a frame to say, I think some of that is murking the water a little bit here, muddying it up such that um, it becomes difficult to parse some of these variables that you're asking about, meaning like, you know, how, how wide a net essentially is a VC able to cast and then there and then secondarily to that what are the actual metrics of success are people using right is increasing user numbers and arr or mrr enough or how far does a vc need to lean towards profitability because that company might need to survive in perpetuity without some sort of exit event right that that company may be at such a high level they can't be acquired reasonably because of um, antitrust laws or because there isn't enough capital in the system right because those companies can't now go and uh borrow money at zero percent interest for that acquisition or you know there is no ipo market such that we can see you know an airbnb style exit in in that form or something something else so um we, we kind of are at time, so I'm going to cut it there for today, and maybe we'll pick up this conversation uh, next week. So thank you all for joining us again for this week's episode of the Scholar AI uh, Founders Pod. We will see you all next week, and be sure to leave your comments in the section below so we can get to them in some upcoming episodes. Thanks. See you next time. Do it,